Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group a Weekly Roundup. This is for the trading week ending October 16, 2020. I'm, I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, don't be a rat brain trader. You want to be the red stripe zebra in this week's theme, market confusion. I should probably say market confusion continues. Anyway, let's take a look at where we were this past week, how things rounded out uh, for the week. I want to look at the uh, global indexes, and as you can see, the um, uh, Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ all finished in the green for the week. Year to date, they're all in the green as well. But if you look at the Russell, it's in the red for the week and, more importantly, for the year. And, of course, if we look at valuations and volatility on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the Ford P.E. ratio is sitting around 25.9. Now, it's lower than the trailing P.E. ratio uh, by 30, oh, a little over 32%. <laughs> so that shows you a little bit of the discount market forces are putting into the Ford guidance, but it's still very high at 25.9. Part of the reason why is if you look at the 10-year Treasury yield, it's still sitting at 74.4 basis points. S&P dividend yields at 1.72%. So that gives us a spread between the dividend yield and the S&P and the 10-year Treasury at about 97.6 basis points or almost 1%. So that continues to channel money into the S&P. Now you can see the current VIX, <coughs> excuse me, the current VIX um, actually, um, it didn't go um, down for the week. It actually moved up 9.5% for the week to close out the week at 27.41, even though the week finished slightly higher. Now remember when you have a positive correlation like this where you have both the volatility going higher and the, and the market index, it tends to portend a little bit of a downdraft coming. Now, if you look at the sector performance, you can see uh, the best was technology coming in for the week at 146. So they continue to lead the way. Year to date, you can see they're up 25.64%. And then, of course, the worst sector for the week, this is two weeks in a row, is the communications sector coming in at 2.65% down. Energy just has gotten clobbered this year in 2020. As we go into, um, you know, Q3 earnings here and into the fourth quarter, you can see uh, energy so far year to date is down almost 55%. Now, if you look at the world index and look at their performance for the year, <coughs> you can see for the week, only the Asian market, China and Hang Sen was up for the week. Um, all of the markets across Europe are down. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All of the markets for the week were down, um, primarily because of sentiment going down and virus potential COVID virus spread for the week. <coughs> and you can see year to date, <coughs> been fighting this cough, guys. <coughs> and no, I don't have COVID. <coughs> But you'd think I do, but I don't. <clears throat> but year to date, you can see uh, all of them. The FTSE still in bearish market territory, <coughs> down for the year, twenty-one point five two percent. CAC forty down seventeen point four three percent. DAX and the Nikkei are down too. China's the only one really strong. <coughs> You can see it's up 9.38% for the year. And then it hangs in because of the Hong Kong issues for 2020. With China, they're down, you know, almost 13.5%. So Europe is not doing that good, guys. Um, <coughs> just not good at all. And if we look at the weekly sound bites, just kind of dovetailing what we've had this week. Let's look at the market performance. As I said, I showed you that. Um, but you can see here, large cap bin, uh, the large cap uh, indexes, you know, they ma narrowly managed to finish a third consecutive week of gains, almost flat, really. The only one down, as I said, was the Russell. Um, so they're just kind of, you know, they've been really strong over the past four weeks, but the past week they've been starting to fizzle out a little bit. We did see industrials and utilities kind of do well. Um, but as I said, communication just did not do good as all. Um, 
and we're seeing that COVID worries even here in the U.S. like Europe kind of dampened sentiment during most of the week. And a lot of investors and market participants are kind of concerned by this continued rise in uh, COVID cases, not only here in the U.S., but primarily in Europe, a fear of shutting down again. And I don't think everybody, the governments are going to do a total shutdown. So if we do have a second wave here, like what we seem to be getting in Europe, and remember Europe's about five to six weeks ahead of us, that would suggest that we're going to get a that would suggest we're going to get a second wave here sometime in the fall time. Um, but we're also seeing Simon affected by uh, J&J and Eli Lilly's uh, vaccine. Stage three trials were delayed because of certain issues um, and adverse of, uh, reactions to some of the drugs. But this is normal, guys. Stage three, you generally have a stop start process anyway. So we should expect this. And it's just a reminder off the March 23rd lows, we've been up 56% in the S&P. So that added shareholder wealth um, to about the tune of $14.2 trillion for those that are in the markets. And what that does, though, with Treasury yields as low as they are, it forces fixed income money managers to chase you know, higher risking uh, yielding, higher risking, higher yielding corporate debt. So that will eventually come back to bite us. But that's kind of what I'm seeing. It's just a sound bite for the market performance. And then, of course, if we look at economic data that came in this past week, it's kind of mixed. You know, we did get some positive news on Friday with core retail sales in September up about 1.4 percent, you know, and it kind of reversed very easily the downward draft in the month of August uh, of 30 basis points. So retail sales is good. I'm expecting very strong, um, <clears throat> very strong Christmas sales. And, you know, with Amazon this week uh, moving up or moving back for the first time, their prime day uh, in October is going to help just bring forward a lot of the Christmas holiday sales, right? So that's going to be a very strong factor. We're seeing tremendous hiring, part-time hiring for the Christmas season by FedEx, UPS, Amazon, some of these companies that really need it. So that's going to be a big help. Um, also, the uh, preliminary gauge of October consumer sentiment surprise uh, a lot of people to the upside as well. One of the negatives for economic data this week was uh, jobless claims. It, it rose to just slightly under uh, 900,000. So it's at a two month high. So remember what I said, we're up off the March 23rd lows by 56%. But now I think we're going to run sideways. We're going to digest a lot of the data that's going on. Uh, we're subject to downside risk. Um, we got um, <clears throat> the issues going on in Europe. So this is kind of what we got to be very particular about this market right now. Um, and the uh, Brexit, yeah, it's still kind of making the news. We've got UK Prime Minister uh, Boris Bulldog Johnson, he said he should get their the country should get ready for a no deal exit from the European Union uh, on December 31st. So we're hoping to get a deal by the end of this month, but clearly that's not going to happen. Um, but Johnson did keep the door open for more talks. But, you know, keep in mind the vote, the uh, yes vote for a Brexit from the European Union happened in July of 2016. And this is four, a little over four years and several months later. Guys, this is just this typical of politicians. They just push off, push off. They don't make the hard news, the hard decisions, because they all want to be reelected, which is why I'm kind of against most all politicians, right? Just do what you have to do. Get the job done. Um, so that's a little bit about what I'm seeing there from that perspective. Um, <clears throat> The other thing, platform companies. Well, for our members, we, I generally go into a little bit more detail on stocks I like and a few other things, but I just thought I'd throw this in here for you guys this weekend. You know, and platform companies over the next five years are going to continue to outperform the rest of the market. You could just build your own index of platform companies, almost like a FANG index, really. Um, and what do I mean by platform companies? Well, this has already been described and, 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 and defined by a lot of hedge funds, basically companies that create transactions or ecosystems between buyers and sellers. So that would be companies like Uber, you know, which kind of stands between a buyer and a seller. And as long as it's kind of like a gun runner, right? You got two, two sides fighting each other and the, 
the guy that's selling the ammunition is going to be the guy that wins because no matter how many bullets are fired, one side wins, one side loses, but the ammunition supplier wins, right? So platform companies kind of sit in the middle. So Uber, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Baba, MasterCard, Visa, um, these are, are, are platform companies. And if you look at nine of the 10 largest tech companies by market cap, uh, in the entire tech space, nine out of 10 are platform companies, and they're going to continue to grow. Of course, the risk in a platform company is that they get uh, they get broken up because we're seeing that coming through uh, right now with, with some of the politicians. But that's kind of what I'm seeing here. Others that I like are Shopify, NVIDIA, ServiceNow, and PayPal. So these are just some of the platform companies that I do like, and you could just make sure, you know, if you've got a 401k, uh, you ought to make sure if you're managing your own 401k, make sure some of those um, shares are in your um, portfolio <clears throat> or you can trade them with options if you want to do it that way also. Now, if I'm going to take you over. Let me just switch the screen here for a second. I'm going to take you over to uh, my FANG index and you're going to see over here. I'm going to let it. It's going to take a couple of minutes to or a couple of maybe 30 or 40 seconds to show on your screen there but what, you, what you're going to see is a weekly chart of the fang index now i've created this special index in e signal and i've in, i've incorporated microsoft facebook apple netflix google and amazon this is about 22 23 percent of the market cap of the s p 500 so where these guys go it kind of pulls the s p along with it you can see this channel now this is a weekly chart this channel really started from a high point back in um, the summer of 2018 and you can see the the perfect formation of this channel and how we came up and we busted outside the northern part of this channel in the summer of this year right as we're coming off the march 23rd lows now you can see off these march 23rd lows just the i've got another trend line just extremely steep because most of these platform companies or fang companies basically you know as long as you can do work online they're very good with the exception of a few like uber and some of the others uh, they've been very strong and you can see when we finally broke that upslope and trend line back in september we had that downdraft in september now i was calling for the downdraft in late july august time frame it delayed it by about a month because as you guys know you can't continue a trajectory like this without pulling back profit taking and then running sideways i thought it would come down and test this upslope and trend line it did not and now we move back up but it's starting to run out of steam again you can see that candle here on this weekly chart uh, that is mostly a bearish candle. Um, if I put it back on a daily chart, let's just zoom in a little bit. You can see here how we're just pulling back to this touch point right here. Now, it, the, the, the numerical value is of no significance because it's just a customized index of, of the fangs. But the fact that it's pulling back probably to its 50 EMA, and you can see the 50 EMA here held up very nicely, you know, for over about seven or eight trading days, about a week and a half. But, yeah, I think it's going to come back and test it. Um, again, so we've just got to watch this very closely and where this goes, it does not mean necessarily that the S and P is going to follow, but it's going to reduce upside returns just because of the large market cap weighting that these things have as part of the S and P. Okay. Now, if we come down here <clears throat> and we look at volatility, you can see the, um, near term vol skew is sitting right near zero which is normal because remember the skew is defined as the vix compared to the front month vol futures and as we come to the front month vol futures expiry which is coming up in the next week um, it's got to be equal to zero but you can see here there is no uh, backwardation structure here but let's go out to october and november you can see in october and november there is no backwardation either but where we get the backwardation is between November, December, uh, and January. Now, I haven't graphed that out, but I'm going to do that for the next um, weekly market watch. That is where we've got the back-assward uh, skew. 
Uh, in other words, November vol futures are higher than December, which is higher than January, and normally it's the other way. So when you get the skew in the red section of the graph, okay, that just tells you that you need to be careful, and the markets are pricing in the possibility of a higher vol event for the coming election. Now, if you guys remember volatility, for those of you who were trading the um, Bush and Gore uh, uh, markets, <clears throat> that was a total surprise. And the markets fell by six and a half percent when it took about three and a half weeks for the Supreme to, to finally make it through the courts up to the Supreme Court to determine who won the election. Bush won, of course, as we all know. But the S&P fell six and a half percent during that six and a, uh, three and a half, four week uh, episode. So now, knowing that we have a higher probability of, of confusion post-election day, the markets have reversed these skews. That's a good news because it does not mean we're going to get a surprise. The markets are starting to price in a vol skew shift. But that does mean that we can get a larger pop to the upside should we have a clear-cut winner, whether it's Democrat or Republican, no matter their policies. Um, Near-term action could be bullish, very bullish if we don't have a surprise and we have a clear-cut winner. If we don't have a clear-cut winner, then depending on who takes over the Senate and how things shake out, it used to be viewed as a, a, a complete Democratic run would be bearish for the markets. But short-term, and a lot of big money, and just talking to some of my big money friends that are in big money hedge funds, billion plus, um, they're viewing that as a, a, a key to unlock the stimulus door even more. And the Democrats, they're not stupid either. They know that more money equals higher markets. And what they will do is put out there an even greater stimulus than the one that the Democrats rejected that the Republicans put out this past week of $1.8 trillion. So, the, you know, the markets don't care who's in control. If there's a lot of money coming to the markets like a five-year-old kid, they're going to look for it. So there is a kind of a thesis out there by big money that if the Democrats run the table, there's going to be a ton of uh, more money coming to the markets and a ton of infrastructure spending. That'll get the markets another three months to six months higher. And then all of that sugar high is going to wear off. And then going into the end of 2021, 2022, it's going to get ugly because keep in mind, by that point in time, the Democrats will have raised taxes, corporate taxes and a whole host of other things. And you're going to have a huge backlash. But near term, which is how most of you guys trade anyway, um, it could be a really interesting time. OK, if we do look at treasuries, you can see on here that uh, in the um, bond market, <clears throat> As I said and I told our members, we, we shifted from this range here to a lower range. Remember, the 30-year bonds or interest rates are moving up a little bit, while the near-term 10-year, 5-year, 2-year, and so forth are staying steady, uh, and the gap is getting wider. That would be the yield spread, right? And as the yield spread steepens, that'll be better for banks. But right now, the yield spread is still fairly shallow, so even though the banks had a relatively mild to slightly bullish kickoff in Q3 earnings, they still finished lower for the week only because, um, most banks anyway, only because that yield spread really needs to get steeper for these guys to start making money. Because um, they they borrow money long and then they, um, or they lend, they borrow money short, lend money long, and when, when that yield spread gets steeper, their net interest margin can increase. Um, but you can see where we're looking here on this. Now, TLT has been our favorite trade for uh, uh, our butterfly trades. Now, we do butterflies a number of different ways. We have what I call baby flies. We have super flies. We have foobar flies. Uh, we have what I call the fly twins. A number of different ways to trade flies. And our secret trader, I'm actually, you know, rather than just saying, hey, here's a trade you guys should take, I actually take the trade and our members can follow along with me. We just shut down a fly that we had that was very successful. We're going to be running more on a monthly basis. So if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and learn how we do our flies because they're a very solid trade in these kind of markets. Now, um, but if you look at TLT, it's staying within this range, you know, and if we go back in time, you can see how the range is just outside of a couple of anomalies 
Um, TLT tends to follow um, longer term interest rates, all right? So that's what's kind of holding it up a little bit, but it, it, I'm sorry, not interest rates, but bond markets. I'm expecting this to stay in the lower quadrant of this range and then eventually find a new range down here for TLT. So doing ratio diagonals to the downside or doing flies where the guts are south of the current price, I think it makes sense uh, in the um, if you want to trade it that way. To me, it's a better trade, a higher probability trade. If we look at the U.S. dollar index, remember it's a dollar index, so um, it tends to go against a basket of other currencies. Um, and it's trying to hold this 50 EMA, and if I blow it up, you can see the red line is a 50 EMA, uh, but I don't know if it's going to be able to climb back up. <clears throat> so to me, I would be neutral to slightly bearish the dollar index, even though Europe is having a lot of trouble. Now, if Europe has to close their borders again, you're going to see the dollar go up because it tends to be a flight to safety, along with the Japanese yen. Not quite as much as the yen, but, you know, fairly close. Uh, so I would be more than willing to play the euro uh, right here, you can see how the euro has just been in this tight range. It hadn't been able to get escape velocity, and I don't think it will until we get a vaccine. Once we get a vaccine, you're going to see the euro move up very strong. You're going to see the dollar move down very strong to the downside, um, and you're going to see the bond market interest rates go up on the further end of the curve like the 30-year. You're going to see the bond market come down. And you're going to see a lot of European money come out of our treasuries and go back into Europe again. Uh, we're not there yet, but I do believe it's going to happen in the next year. And we'll be able to get a tell on when it's starting to happen. If we look at metals, if we look at gold, all right, remember with gold right now, I am not making a trade in gold. It is just, it is a long consolidation period with gold. I had an original target of gold up here around 2200. Do I think it'll get up there? Yes. Not yet. I want to see gold get back up above this 23.6 retracement level from the highs that gold made back in um, uh, early August of this year. <clears throat> so outside of that, then I just don't see gold moving in here. Same thing with silver. However, our copper trade, we've been long copper uh, and we got long copper right back over here in early April. I got our members in. We have several members that went long copper futures, but a lot of us took the um, Freeport McMoran play. It's probably a better play. It's less risky than just holding copper futures, but it's been, it's almost a, a triple for us. Okay. Um, if we look at Freeport McMoran, because I put out a list of eight stocks that our members should get into in early April. Here's Freeport McMoran. We got into this stock a little over $6 a share. Now it's sitting at $17.15. So like I said, it's just about a triple on, on the stock. <clears throat> and we got good money in this. And, and now uh, coming back over here, once it rid up, uh, came back up uh, in um, early September, we started hedging the trade for a sideways movement. And that's kind of what it's done for you know a little bit over a month or so. Um, and I think it'll continue sideways, drifting higher, though, because um, copper is going to go where China goes. So that's a little bit about how we're playing that. Now, oil, if you're trading Thinkorswim or Interactive Brokers, the way they've changed the way you can trade oil, they've made it very difficult. You can't get into the options market in the oil futures like you could before. So now this is just more for informational purposes. Uh, only, uh, but we do want to follow the oil market because it shows a sense of strength or weakness in the overall global demand of energy, which is tied proportionally to uh, the growth of local economies, you know, worldwide. And you can see we've been running sideways. Um, we played oil off the March lows. You can see it went below the zero rate here, and this is what really upset the oil market. The May futures in uh, the third week in April, it just took a bath. OK, so this is kind of where we're sitting right now with oil futures. Nat gas, <clears throat> if we look at this one, we're coming up and we're making new highs, but we do not have a bearish divergence. So I honestly thought I wanted when price was falling down and then I said, OK, if it comes up, we'll get a, a bearish divergence, what we call a bed. We did not get it. Why? Because it had a lot of strength on this move higher. That meant buyers were supporting this move higher. So what I want to see now is for it to come back, a little bit of profit taken, and then make another run 
And the ideal scenario would be able to make a higher high, but give us a divergence here. We get that, we're all over it. Um, I do think longer term, that gas is going to come down, but that's just kind of where we're sitting right now in this market. All right, everybody, that's just a quick take on where we're looking at in the market. Members, this Sunday evening on our weekly market watch, I'll spend more time on some of our platform companies um, and then some option trades and just some of the things that we're looking on here um, in the coming week with the election just, um, you know, three weeks away. Have a great weekend, everybody. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. We were having a great years, uh, doing really well, and I think you'll enjoy it. Take care, everybody. Ciao now.